changed the name in post, uh, so if you are coming in wanting to watch gameplay, I'm really sorry. Um, but again, this is still the law dump of the library. So, the Nidapaya tribe. Uh, the Nidapaya reside in unique wooden structures in the wetlands. Their advanced architectural techniques are used throughout the world to repair and maintain many damaged ancient ruins. This is how the world at large knows about the Nidapaya. But the Nid Nidapaya possess a secret that they do not wish to share with the world, rest of the world. Uh, that is the ancient ruins of the Nidapaya kingdom reside, reside beneath their land. In ancient times, the surrounding lands were all controlled by the sovereign Nipodaya Kingdom, and the city of ruins was the seat of the last, that last monarch. Special attention should be given uh, to the way the sovereign was chosen. While the Nipodaya did not have a monarchy, the king was not decided by birth. Did have a monarchy? The king was not decided by birthright, but the abilities and quantities qualities he displayed during a certain required ceremony. This ceremony employed a special plant that grew in the sun garden residing in the deepest area of the royal city. This plant was known as the stairway to the sun. The stairway to the sun was an extremely poisonous plant and its effects were fatal if consumed. Though some individuals possessed a natural resistance to the poison, the Nipodaya people believed that a man who could prevail against the poison was destined to become king. A uh, vestige is of this ceremony is still carried out once a year by the Nipodaya for the continual peace of their ancestor spirits. Even with a natural resistance, finding an individual that could survive ingestion of the powerful poison was a rarity. It is said by the Nipodaya people that one such as a, one such man reigned this king for hundreds of years. Whether this legend had any validity. Uh, to it cannot be ascertained at the present. What is known is that this once flourishing kingdom fell into decline and was eventually abandoned by the Nipodaya people. It is not known what made the Nipodaya abandon their city for the wetlands as any information regarding uh, these matters comes from oral traditions and hearsay which obviously calls into question the validity of this information. What is known through though is that after leaving the city, the Nipodaya viewed it as a sacred ground and vowed to keep its existence hidden from the outsiders. All Nipodaya males between the ages of 13 and 25 are required to spend two years in the city to guard and protect it. It is throughout their continued vigilance that this great city's existence has been kept undiscovered by the outside world. There was, however, one incident of outsiders discovering the secret city in the 1960s. A corporation went into the secret city to find the plant used in their ceremonies and take it by force. The Nipodaya fiercely resisted this incursion into their land. In times of peace, the Nipodaya are builders of great renown, but when needed for war arises, when the need for war arises, they can become stout warriors. This app, uh, adaptability is the essence of the Nipodaya. Their physical prowess in battle was their greatest weapon and they used it to fight bravely but they were overwhelmed by the enemy's technological advantages. During this time many of the Nipodaya used consumed the plant in an effort to fight off the invaders. In the end the Nipodaya were forced to cede the area of the Sun Garden and beyond to the corporation's control but the Nipodaya have not yet given up hope of one day reclaiming the sacred land and returning it to its former glory. U8 is the name of the BOW born from the weapons development project involving Las Plagas, the creature in comparison of the refined DNA of multiple organisms, specifically the DNA of shelled organisms. The alteration to its aspect of the creature is reflected in its dark coloring. The carapace has an unparalleled durability and was shown to be resilient to direct hits from RPGs and tests. The gigantic creature has another special feature in its design. The U8 is some tens of meters tall and its pincer legs are over three meters in length, which it uses as a weapon in close combat. These pincer attacks are not especially quick, but they are powerful enough to pierce the armor of a tank. 
Flying BOWs reside in the part of the U8's abdomen originally intended for the maturation of eggs uh, in an unaltered specimen. Uh, the flying BOWs are not larvae U8s, but completely different creatures entirely. In a close quarters one to one fight, the U8 is an overwhelmingly powerful adversary, but when it has the combat to combat more than one opponent, its large size becomes somewhat of a liability. Its considerable bulk also makes it vulnerable to long range attacks. To compensate for this weakness, it uses the flying BOWs in much the same way uh, an aircraft carrier uses jet fighters. Some would consider UA an impeccable uh, fighting machine, but it does have its flaws. U8 size uh, can be uh, detrimental because it requires a massive amount of sustenance to maintain functionality. As such, the U8 is not suitable for long-term assignments. According to the Tricell's business information, the U8 is most effective uh, as security for the facility or when used in attacks on limited time. Before it can be used in an offensive attacks, consideration must be given uh, to the means of transporting the U8 to the destination. Also, the U8 is designed to reach a large size very rapidly, and this breeds imperfections in its carapace. Uh, these imperfections are limited to certain areas of the carapace, uh, but direct attack on this area will se severely damage the U8. Even with these flaws, the U8's function, uh, functionality, combat effectiveness, and relative uh, ease to control have made it popular in the bioweapons market. Records indicate that Ricardo Irving has sold a multi <coughs> multitude of both the original U8 and the upgraded U8 Prime, which is a multi-layered carapace for extra defense, along with shell covering formerly exposed areas. There are plans at one point to design a lighter, faster U8 that could maintain functionality for longer periods of time, but this would result in significant downgrade in its defensive capabilities. The plan appears to have been scrapped. Chris Redfield and she Sheva Olimar reported uh, imperfections to the carapace of the U8 they faced, so it's suspected that it was one of the original models. Note that the U in U8 does not stand for Ouroboros, but for Ultimate. Tricell! Tricell is a conglomerate organization comprised of shipping, natural resources development, and pharmaceutical divisions. Tricell's history dates back to the period known as the Age of Exploration. The forebearers to Tricell was Travis Trading, a company owned by the wealthy European merchant Thomas Travis. This company profited greatly uh, from the expensive trading with the Euro Orient and laid the groundwork for what would become Tricell Shipping Division. Travis Trading entered the 19th century as a profitable trading venture in the 18th century or 1800s, Henry Travis, the youngest of seven siblings, invested much of his own fortune into the exploration of Africa. During this period, the exploits of the explorers like David Livingston were creating quite a stir in the newspaper of the day. Henry's expedition was inspired by these accounts and his decision to have a great impact in, on Travis Trading's future. Henry made five expeditions to the African continent in order to explore all of its regions. The extensive funds of Travis's family uh, allowed him to continue his research into Africa, even though time, even through times resulting, uh, <clears throat> even through times when results were not forthcoming. After his fifth and final expedition in Africa, Henry Travis returned to his home country a full 35 years after he had first left it. Henry compiled the records of his expeditions into an impressive. 72 volumes set entitled Survey of Natural History. These books covered everything from animals, plants, insects, minerals, and topography to the native inhabitants and their culture, histories, and traditions. These books also contained uh, extensive records detailing the folklore of various people throughout the continent. Uh, these tombs were a veritable encyclopedia of the African continent. Henry's survey was published in its entirety, but his meticulous details were viewed as products of creative license and overzealous imagination. The books were ultimately uh, discredited by the scientific community. <coughs> Considered to be an old novelty, 
item, only a few copies of the entire series were ever published. The shock of being shunned by the scientific community sent Henry into a deep state of depression. He passed away only two years after his return from Africa. It is now believed that the head of the Travis trading at the time, Henry's eldest brother, firstly spread rumors, uh, spread the rumor that Henry's books were nothing more than fiction. Uh, the thought that being that he did this because he wanted Travis Trading to be the only company that could exploit the information contained within those books. Of particular interest was the topographical uh, information contained in volume 17 through to 24. By the end of the 19th century, Travis Trading had begun to exploit the mineral resources of Africa. All over the continent, the company was mining for precious metals and discovering slash developing oil and natural gas fields. Meanwhile, the company's profits continued to soar. These operations formed the basis of Tricell's natural resources development division. Travis Trading built a firm foothold in Africa and began beginning in the mid 20th century a century they had begun to ex actively collect samples of plant animals and insects Henry's books were instrumental in the guiding of these endeavors the collected species were used in pharmaceutical research and before long the research brought commercial success and the subsequent founding of Tricell's pharmaceutical division Travis trading was the basis of the shipping division the Natural Resources Development Division was born from the information contained in Henry's journals. The specimens obtained from Africa fauna were used to create independent pharmaceutical divisions. By the 1960s, these three divisions of Travis Trading uh, were firmly established and they formed a conglomerate under the name Tricell. The Travis family, however, were not the only ones privy to the knowledge of Henry's journals. Umbrella's founder, Oswald E. Spencer, was interested in them for the folklore recorded therein. Of a particular interest, uh, the accounts of their Nipidias rituals. Spencer hypothesized that the flower used in their rituals held significance, and this ultimately led to the discovery of the progenitor virus. Cool. Three more, guys. Three more. <coughs> Just let me... Have a sip of my OJ. Listed within this file is a general background of information overview of former STARS member agent Jill Valentine. As pieced together from various sources, the information listed here is neither complete nor should it be used as a psychological analysis of the subject. When a crisis situation arises, few soldiers excel to the level of Jill Valentine. She is a proficient uh, in the use of various firearms, is a master at lockpicking, and is skilled in the disposal of explosives. Jill's talents make her an integral component of any fighting force. Like Chris Redfield, Jill was a member of the Stars Alpha team. She was also involved in the tragedy known as the Arclay uh, Research Facility, also known as the Mansion Incident. During the incident, Jill and Chris operated independently, but together discovered the truth behind the facility. They learned that Barry Bruton was not really a traitor, but was being controlled by Albert Wesker, captain of the Alpha team. In addition to Wesker's machinations, they also learned the source of the zombie outbreak was due to the release of the T-Virus, and that Umbrella was more than just an ordinary pharmaceutical company. What Jill learned at the Arclay Research Facility uh, would have profound repercussions on the rest of her life. Following their return from the mansion, Chris and Jill attempted to inform the authorities of Umbrella's activities. For all their good intentions, they were met with no movement towards any official investigation into the company. Fed up with the lack of response, the two took it upon themselves to investigate Umbrella. They concentrated their effort on Umbrella's main base of operations in Europe. As a STARS member interested with the protection of Raccoon City, Jill chose to remain in the city for a time being and investigated the Umbrella Research Facility there before rendezvousing, rendezvousing with Chris in Europe. These decisions led to her involvement in Raccoon, the Raccoon City incident. During her investigation, rodents infected with the T-Virus from the Arclay Research Facility began to spread the virus into the city. The virus quickly spread infecting the majority of the residents. Umbrella 
the perpetrator hid behind this incident reacted swiftly. Umbrella sent the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service, the UBC has, to handle the situation and they also dispatched the bioweapon nemesis T-Type to take out any surviving Stars members who Umbrella now considered a threat. Jill attempted to escape Raccoon City all the while being hunted by the nemesis T-Type. During this time she encountered a member of the UBCS, Carlos Oliveira. Carlos claimed his mission was on a rescue mission to save any survivors in the Raccoon City. Having no reason to doubt that mission's purpose, he proposed to help Jill escape. Jill, on the other hand, had her doubts. However, the situation had reached critical proportions and Jill don't have, did not have the luxury of time. The US government was planning on containing the spread of the virus by launching a special missile strike on the city called uh, Operation Basilisk Terminate. When Jill became infected with the T-Virus as a result of the Nemesis T-Type, she despaired of ever being able to get out alive. Fortunately for her, Carlos was there to help. Carlos obtained a cure to the T-Virus infection and gave it to Jill. After her recovery, she worked with Carlos and they successfully escaped from Raccoon City. In 2003, after Operation uh, T-Alos, uh, Jill and Chris became two of the original 11 founding members of the BSAA and joined them in their fight against bioterrorism and bioweapons around the world. Never thought the other one. Chris and Jill stopped bioweapons in Asia, destroyed bioweapons, uh, uh, destroyed bioweapon labs in South America, arrested smugglers in Europe and patrolled the world in an attempt to stamp out all bioweapons throughout their activities. Uh, while they may have suspected the long fingers of Umbrella being involved, there were never any conclusive proof. Those long fingers, however, would turn out to be the connection connected to the hands of Umbrella's founder, Oswald E. Spencer. The pair received intel on Spencer's whereabouts and rushed off to arrest him only to find their former captain and hated enemy, Albert Wesker. Seeing Spencer's crumpled corpse on the ground, the two changed their plans to arrest Wesker instead. In a two-on-one fight, Chris and Jill should have had an advantage, but Wesker's strength and agility were well beyond any normal human. For all their training, Jill and Chris were no match for Wesker. As Wesker was about to end Chris's life, Jill made the ultimate sacrifice. Lunging at Wesker, she threw both herself and him out of a window and over the side of a cliff. Chris would do no could do nothing as he watched his partner fall to her death. BSA launched a full-scale search operation, but neither Jill's body nor any of her personal effects were ever recovered. On November 23, 2006, Jill Valentine was officially declared dead, and her name was added to the list of BSAA members who died in the line of duty. But Jill's story did not end there. The fall did not kill Jill nor Wesker, though badly hurt and unconscious Jill was saved by Wesker. After giving her the medical treatment she required, he placed her in a cryogenic sleep. Once the Herbers plan was finalized, Wesker intended to use her as the first set test subject. This was Wesker's way of exacting his vengeance. Fortunately for Jill, luck was on her side. The apparatus monitoring her vital signs detected some abnormalities. Jill was ha uh, something was happening inside Jill's body, and Wesker's curiosity was piqued. Further investigations showed that a mutated form of the T virus was still inside her body. It was a remnant of her infection in Raccoon City. The cure she was given was supposed to have eradicated all traces of the virus in her body, but instead it caused the virus to go into a dormant state. Her extended period in cryogenic sleep somehow reactivated the virus. Shortly after being reactivated, the T-Virus completely disappeared from her body, but it left something in its place. Wesker found that Jill's body now contained powerful antibodies to the virus. All those years, the T-Virus was inside her body, forced it to develop a defense system that was nothing short of miraculous. This discovery would help further Wesker's ambitions. The development of the Ouroboros virus, the centerpiece of the Ouroboros plan, had proven to be quite difficult. The Ouroboros virus developed from the progenitor flower proved to be too poisonous to humans uh, to be of much use. Instead, spurring the next step in human evolution, it only invited death. Wesker theorized that using Jill's antibody could say, make the virus less poisonous. He kept Jill alive solely to produce antibodies for his research. Jill, who had uh, reviled bioweapons and devoted her life to eradicating them, was ironically being used to develop the most terrible bioweapon of all. After much research and experimentation, 
Wesker finally perfected the Ouroboros virus. Jill's participation in its development meant that she no longer uh, was no longer a suitable test subject. Pure and unadulterated by the antibodies with a high resistance to the virus permeated through her body. Wesker decided he would find a suitable use for her elsewhere. During the research into progenitor virus, an ancillary chemical was discovered. The research referred to it simply as P30. When administered to the test subjects, it would not only give them superhuman strength, but also render them highly susceptible to control. P30 was the ultimate performance enhancer. The aims of the Ouroboros plan were to create a new breed of hu uh, humans, so P30's applications in this plan inconse uh, was inconsequential. However, for the time being, it could be marked as a product and greater <coughs> garner additional funding. The research into creating the ultimate soldier who didn't resist or orders was carried out simultaneously on Las Plagas and P30. Unfortunately, the latter had severe drawbacks. The effects uh, for P30 would only last for several sh uh, for a very short time. An injection of P30 was metabolized and expelled by the body at an expanded rate, requiring re-administration of the drug at a frequent intervals. This greatly lessened the viability of such a product as a long-term performance enhancer. The only counter to such drawback was the attach, uh, was to attach a device to the subject that would continually administer that drug. While P40's effects were brief, it was still a powerful and effective drug. Uh, the effects of continuation, uh, continual administration were untested, so in order to research this aspect further, an administration device was attached to Jill. Uh, an external device was attached to Jill's chest that would continually administer the drug to her body with her free will constantly being usurped. She remained a servant to Excella and Wesker until Chris and Sherva destroyed the administration device. Excella Gione. The Gione family is a well known and respected throughout Europe for the successful export import business. Her grandfather being from the Travis, Family, the founders of Triceville, has endowed Excella with quite a noble and storied lineage. Blessed with the model like beauty and raised in such an uh, aristocratic family, has led to her being haughty towards those around her, especially men. But it was neither Excella's looks or family background that got her uh, to where she is today. Gifted with a keen intellect and inherent inheriting her father's business acumen, Alexa quickly breezed through school and enrolled in a university at a young age. Uh, there she majored in genetic engineering and her talents were recognized by her grandmother's family uh, With her connection she was able to enter Tricell's pharmaceutical division at the age of 18 Although she was a gifted member of Tricell's founding family She was still a Gione an offshoot of the na famed Travis family even with all the research teams at Tricell's disposal She was only given one uh, Excella viewed this as an act as a slight while still feeling uh, indignant over this affront, she was approached by Albert Wesker. Wesker's interest in Excella was piqued by her intelligence and character. It was at this time he provided her with all the information he had concerning the T-virus and other research. Excella was now armed with the tools to make the advances to her career that she desired. She used this information and technology she obtained from Wesker to advance Tricell's bioweapons division exponentially. <sighs> get myself a drink of OJ. In a fortunate turn for Tricell, Umbrella, who had previously dominated the bioweapons market, had gone bankrupt, greatly increasing Tricell's sway in this area. Thanks to Excella's efforts in expanding Tricell's market share, she was given more of a voice within the company. Before long, she was making key decisions that would affect the fortunes of the pharmaceutical division. This was precisely what Wesker had, as Wesker had intended. Excella then set her sights on the position of CEO of Tricell's African division. Her, uh, Adria dropped use of flattery and intimidation soon landed her pow that powerful position. It is now believed that it was Wesker who suggested Excella take over Tricell Africa. He exploited her romantic interest in him and was able to use both her and Tricell Africa to further his Ouroboros plan. 
Excel is first order of business at Tricells Africa's as Tricells Africa's CEO was to restore the imba uh, abandoned umbrella facility. No. Abandoned Umbrella Africa research facility as the facility where the research on the progenitivirus had been carried out. Its use in the completion of the Ouroboros plan was vital. Following the facility's restoration, Ricardo Irving was employed to sell bioweapons in order to secure funding for the research being carried out on the Ouroboros virus. As the Ouroboros plan neared completion, Excella began to fancy herself as the queen in the New World Order that would follow the plan's execution. Fortunately for her, those dreams were dashed when the man that was to be her king injected her with the Ouroboros virus. Oh, and lastly, Wesco. The mansion incident, the tragedy at Raccoon City, Rockford Island, Umbrella's Antarctic Research Facility, and the Umbrella Caucus Facility in Russia. The kidnapping of the US President's daughter, one man was involved either directly or indirectly with each and every one. These incidents, Albert Wesker. The motivation behind all of Wesker's actions can be found in this current incident in Africa. Wesker had already obtained samples of various organisms and viruses including the T virus, the G virus, the T Veronica virus and Les Pagas. All of these were eagerly and enthusiastically received by Umbrella's former rival companies who compensated him greatly for each. With wealth, power and glory, Wesker appeared to have everything a person could ever want. Wesker however was not interested in material gains. An all too familiar sense of uh, trepidation continued to gnaw at him. The source of his uneasiness being with Umbrella's founder, Oswald E. Spencer. During his time as at Umbrella, Wesker could never ascertain what Spencer's true intentions were. Spencer's extensive funding of POW research was unheard of in the field. Uh, the whole reason for producing bioweapons was that it could be done relatively uh, inexpensively when combined with normal weapon delivery systems. Spencer's extreme investment in BOWs seemed unnecessary. Why would Spencer need such BOWs in the first place? To find the answer to that question, Wesker joined Umbrella's information department. Even after the downfall of Umbrella, these doubts continued to haunt Wesker. To find the answers he needed, uh, Wesker began to search out Spencer. The only problem was that, even more before Umbrella's dissolution, Spencer had removed himself from Umbrella's day-to-day -day operations. Wesker had to use every resource at his disposal, all his time, money, and connections. Eventually, he ascertained, ascertained Spencer's long, hidden whereabouts. On the first night of autumn, as thunder and lightning raged in the skies above, Wesker arrived at the ancient castle in Europe, where Spencer resided. Wesker expected the old man to be surprised by his presence, but instead, the withered old man's eyes of uh, the withered old eyes of Spencer lit up with a dark delight as he spoke. Go back. The words barely audible in the midst of his uh, cough-wracking laugh. If Wesker had his doubts about Spencer before, he didn't know what to make of him now. <coughs> He only knew at that moment that this seemingly feeble old man had been in control of everything that had transpired at Umbrella. Even Wesker's own actions uh, through the years had been controlled and manipulated by this decrepit old man. With this sudden realization, Wesker now knew the source of his anxiety of all those years. Appearing to read Wesker's thoughts, uh, Spencer laid everything out to him. The development of bioorganic weapons was only a means of achieving his true goal, the forced evolution of mankind via viruses. It would be the end of the current form of humanity and the birth of a new superior human race. With this new race, he would build his utopia with himself as God on Earth. <coughs> In order to realize his dreams, uh, he required three things. One, the progenitor virus. Without his key component, his dreams would not be no more than abstract ideas. Once he discovered the progenitor virus, he had the foundation on which to, of which all his subsequent plans would be built. Two, the Umbrella Corporation. 
The manufacture of bioweapons was the perfect method of conducting his research of the progenovirus. Any profits gained through Umbrella's research were secondary to his true goal. Uh, the third thing Spencer needed in his grand vision was Wesker himself. Spencer knew what was required for his utopia. He also knew that he would need a new human race, but it would be a new breed. But what would the new breed of humans be like? The progenitor virus would spur natural selection upon the popula population. That was the fundamental premise behind Spencer's plan. But if the new breed of humans brought by about by the selection process were unwilling to share in his vision, then there would be unwanted complications. This fourth stage of evolution would be given the surviving humans increased strength and intelligence, but it would not affect a person's knowledge, logic, or general character. Any uh, indolent or unsavory individuals, I think it's supposed to say insolent, but hey, indolent or unsavory individuals uh, survived to be part of this new race, it would be a blight on Spencer's utopia. Spencer was not about to have his vision strained, so he enacted a plan to ensure that it would not happen. This plan was called the Wesker Plan, which was named after the chief researchers at the t after the chief researcher at the time. According to this plan, hundreds of children born to parents of superior intellect from all uh, nationalities would be collected. If their knowledge, logic, and self-will uh, could not be altered by the genetic manipulation, then Spencer himself would instill his values onto these children by whatever means he deemed necessary. These children were all given the surname Wesker, and after completion of their indoctrination slash manipulation, they were placed into select controlled environments in various locations around the world, uh, ever under Umbrella's watchful eye. The children themselves were to be kept unaware uh, they were being monitored. With Umbrella's concealed aid, they all received the best education available in the fields they pursued. After a few years, one child who showed particular promise was sent to the Umbrella's training facility in Raccoon City. This Wesker's child was named Albert. Spencer was quite pleased by all uh, of Albert's actions and if the other Wesker children were like him, Spencer would have nothing but quality individuals for his new race of humanity. Spencer then enacted the second phase of his plan. All the Wesker children would be administered by an experimental, uh, would be administered an experimental virus. This virus was administered to screen out the more gifted of the Wesker children. Some took uh, the viruses on recommendation of a friend. Others were given the viruses as part of their medical treatment. Still others had it forcibly administered to them. Albert Wesker was no different. His partner, William Birkin, gave him the experimental virus and he administered it to himself. Uh, this screening process turned out to uh, be a little too selective. Most of the Wesker children died, leaving only a few survivors. Albert Wesker was one of those survivors, and he disappeared shortly after. Spencer uh, was unconcerned by this development. There was a fail-safe device attached to every Wesker Spencer's ex uh, existence. This was the discomfort Alfred felt throughout his life. All the children were programmed to seek Spencer out, which manifested itself as a growing anxiety within each of the subjects. Just as Spencer predicted, Albert soon came to him. Unfortunately, Spencer had made one miscalculation. His failsafe not only worked for as long as it remained a mystery. As soon as the mystery was revealed, Spencer uh, Wesker no longer had any need to restrain himself. All uh, that was uh, impeding Wesker was this feeble old man on death's door straps. The right to be a god, that right is now mine. With these words, Wesker broke from the shackles that Spencer had laid on him. Uh, in it was only random chance that brought his former subordinates, Chris Redfield and Jill we uh, Valentine, to Spencer's mansion at the exact same time, but Wesker took it as a sign. The weak would always resist the will of the chosen. With renewed purpose, Wesker reflected on its own evolution and the evolution of the human race. After the incident at the Spencer estate, he would undergo and use the news of uh, his death. He went underground, not undergo and used the news of his death to veil his activities. He had achieved his goal of uh, obtaining the virus and capital he needed from the position, from his position at Umbrella. Next, he put all of his efforts into bringing his Ouroboros plan to fruition and thereby 
setting himself up as the god over a new generation of humanity. Alright guys. That be all the lore in the files. And these be extra figures. I'm not going to bother going through them all. You can have this one. And maybe this one too. But yeah, that's it. Um, again, follow, like, and subscribe. Uh, we'll be do actually doing my Shaver playthrough uh, in this part. This stuff I won't uh, hold back. I'll kind of upload it immediately, but put it in my second playlist. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you'll see that there's two playlists about one for the original, and then that'll be part of the ultra list. Everything else will be on its side, uh, on its standalone. Uh, again, Twitch and YouTube are on its cloud 2275. Look left, look right, there's buttons all over the place. Enjoy it.